Jesus knew his friend Lazarus, brother to Mary and Martha, was ill, but he remained where he was for two more days. Then knowing Lazarus had died, he travels to Bethany. By the time he arrives, it's already been four days. Before he even makes it to the town center, he's met by Martha, who greets him with, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, you can hear it. Her anger, her disappointment, her sorrow. You could have done something, and you didn't. And now here we are. Lazarus had been dead for four days, and in the Jewish thought at the time, it was believed that on the fourth day, the soul departed from the body. Mary and Martha knew that Jesus was capable of miracles. Couldn't he have done something? But now their belief that something could be done is replaced with hopelessness. It's been four days. It's too late. There's no life left here anymore. Mary stayed at home while Martha ran out. So Jesus asks for Mary to meet him. And Mary kneels at his feet with the same refrain as her sister. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You can hear the sorrow, the sadness, and the confusion. Even as she kneels before him, a sign of understanding that Jesus is her Lord and Savior, she's confused as to why this happened. When Jesus sees Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. While the silence of death is loud, the tears of grief in this moment are louder. The hopelessness feels all-encompassing, like a dust storm, swirling around them, and it stings, and it whips, and it bites, and it howls as it moves. Jesus is disturbed in spirit, deeply moved, and asks the question he doesn't know the answer to since he arrived to Bethany too late. Where have you laid him? The mourners around him say, come and see. And Jesus begins to weep. Overcome with the emotions of the mourners, his love for Lazarus, his love for Mary and Martha, Jesus weeps. Mary and Martha's refrain, if you had been here, sounds like something we might have cried out during the past year. As we mark a year since the pandemic was declared a pandemic, I've been reflecting on the last few pre-pandemic days, what it felt like when we heard the phrase, safer at home, when we started seeing an abundance of caution and suddenly everything became unprecedented. We have experienced new depths of despair and hopelessness during this past year. We had no idea how long this would last. How many lives would be lost? The sin that would be exposed, sin built in to our policies, police practices, and our health systems. We know the weeping that has lingered, as our psalmist says, And while the psalmist says the weeping lingers for a night, we might scoff at the idea of the weeping just lasting for a night because we have been weeping for a year. This year has asked us to keep moving to a new rhythm within these days that have felt rhythmless. As we've gotten the hang of one rhythm, we've had a tempo change, and suddenly we've been forced to find a new rhythm. One such place is school. School for two days, school for four days, there's been an exposure, and now everything is virtual. Parents being asked to be teachers, and teachers having to learn how to teach in entirely new ways. Keeping time and keeping in rhythm is hard when it all keeps changing. Like our psalmist who speaks of sitting in a pit far away from God, 
we too know the feeling of sitting in a pit unable to praise God. It's hard to speak of God's faithfulness when the walls seem tall and there's no ladder to be found. Yet the psalmist sets up a pattern, one that we also see in our story in John today. The psalmist psalmist writes, I cried out, and follows it with you, referring to God, helped. Prayers for help are followed by prayers of thanksgiving. God is a helper for the psalmist, not just in the seasons when everything is good, but in all seasons, including the difficult ones. And this pattern of praise is not just a pattern to make a psalm, but it becomes a way of life. Salvation is not just a restoration of those who need their prayers heard and answered. Our salvation, already given to us, is finding the language of joy and gladness that goes with life. Our salvation is finding the praise that is life in contrast to the silence of death around us. Jesus' words and actions that follow the cries of Mary and Martha illustrate this salvation. Martha's interaction with Jesus is met with the reminder, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Martha's pain is justified and overwhelming. Her beloved brother is gone. And in expressing her good grief, she's reminded that the resurrection doesn't just come at the end of time, but it's offered right now. Through this, Martha can confess the identity of Jesus, praising through her confession what so many others were unable to notice. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Realizing God can hold our anger, our sorrow, our grief, and accompanies us through it, she finds herself again able to speak of God's faithfulness. And then we get Mary's interaction with Jesus that leads to his weeping. And it reminds us who it is that we are praising. We're praising the God who is with us. Jesus invites Mary to come and meet him after she stayed behind in the house while Martha had run out. I'm reminded of a scene in Frozen. Frozen begins telling the story of a close-knit friendship between two sisters, Anna and Elsa. And after Elsa accidentally hurts Anna with her superpower of creating ice and snow and all frozen things, Elsa pulls back from her. The girls lose their parents. And after this, Elsa, caught in her grief and her fear, continues to retreat and hide away from Anna. But Anna, the persistent younger sister, continues knocking and knocking and knocking and asking for Elsa to come out. Well, Elsa never comes out. Mary does. And by doing so, by sharing her grief, Jesus weeps with her. Jesus, like Anna, is asking for us to both share our grief and to hold one another's grief. We're reminded by Jesus' example to seek out those who grieve, especially in this year when so much grieving has had to happen in isolation. So who will we call? Who can we share our grief and heartache with? Who can we call and listen to as they share theirs? Who can we weep with? Jesus' tears remind us that we praise a God who weeps with us. God incarnate human among us feels our pain and sorrow to the point of weeping with us. We can speak of God's faithfulness as God with us, even now. 
we can offer our praise and our deepest thanksgiving that our God is the one who accompanies us. Jesus goes on to say to those who are gathered, remove the stone in front of the tomb and calls, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, covered in the bindings of burial cloths, walks out. This action was coming the whole time, and yet Jesus' spirit, disturbed and deeply moved, wept among the people first. And even though this is a story of resurrection, of Lazarus living again, the Lord is fully with us in our grief. Martha and Mary aren't stagnant in their grief. They're moving through it. They move in their mourning to praise in the midst. And Jesus moves too, towards and with those who are grieving. The human dust that seemed lifeless is dancing yet again. We don't quite have a resurrection like Lazarus coming out of the tomb covered in cloths before us. Yet we have made it through this year doing what the poet Wendell Berry calls practicing resurrection. This picture made me think of practicing resurrection. It comes from a performance of a choreo poem, which means that it's both a play and both poetry. And this is from the play For Colored Girls by Ntozaki Shange. And in For Colored Girls, women are telling their stories using choreography, using dance, and expressing deep heartbreak. And as they move through their heartbreak and these heart-wrenching stories, they are still telling stories of love and of friendship and of hope. And this comes to mind because we too have shared our stories. We have found ways over and over again to praise, to experience joy and thanksgiving. The world kept turning last March. The very dust that we're made of, our weary and our worried dust, has worked to remember the rhythm that's always been there, the rhythm that's never changed, the one God offers to our lives, the rhythm of hope in the midst of all struggle. So we've had virtual weddings. We've had drive through celebrations and receptions. You all put one on for me, and that's how I met most of you. People have still moved, including some of our new members who are joining today in the middle of this pandemic. Folks have had children, and we have found ways to celebrate. And the practice of resurrection hasn't just been seen outside the walls, but in the lives of so many people here and in our practices of parking lot small groups and picnics and virtual youth Sundays. The choir just gathered recently on Zoom together. We practice resurrection through our opportunities for generosity, like the House of Bread and our almsgiving. I think of us practicing resurrection each time Ann Curran asks answers someone's question about signing up for a vaccine. I also think of our celebratory selfies each time someone gets their vaccine that are such a joy to see. Our dust has found ways to dance. These faithful motions in our mourning have allowed us to love God and to love our neighbor. And we have witnessed God's grace, and we have found ways to respond in gratitude to it. Our weeping has stayed through the night and with us this whole year. And there's probably more weeping ahead. But rejoicing comes in the morning. Hope persists through the dust storms of grief, even now. So keep practicing resurrection 
dancing to the rhythm within that tethers us to one another and to God. For you, God, turned our wailing into dancing. You removed our sackcloth and clothed us with joy, that our hearts may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, our God, we will praise you forever. Amen.